Uh, welcome again. Now we've got another panel discussion this evening, and uh, today it's uh, an exciting array of uh, startups that we have here. And uh, the intention yesterday we had a panel discussion to look at uh, how enterprises are applying um, analytics and what are some of the problems that they're facing. Uh, today is going to be a different one. The theme today is to look at uh, what are the horizons on real time analytics. These guys being in startups, obviously, they are trying to push the envelope of. Uh, what is possible, and we thought that it would be very exciting for you guys to get some perspectives directly from them in terms of understanding where things are heading, and also to uh, to demystify certain things that uh, people have been talking about over the last couple of days. I have the good opportunity of introducing uh, a galaxy of people on stage. Um, uh, to my right is uh, Satya Kaliki. He's co-founder and VP of, uh, can you raise your hand? Yep. Co-founder and VP of Engineering and Architecture at Index. Index is building a product intelligence platform for brands, retailers, and developers to enable product-aware apps and pervasive commerce. Previously, Satya played various roles like CDO at Harvard Medical School and was co-founder of a few startups in the space of analytics, healthcare, and networking. That's Satya for you. Thanks, Satya. And then uh, we have uh, Sanjeev on my extreme uh, uh, left. Sanjeev Jha is the head of analytics and data at Comili. He has over 18 years of experience uh, working with large enterprises as well as multiple successful startups in India and the US. His experience spans uh, development of big data and analytics solutions, uh, development of machine, machine learning algorithms, business solutions, highly scalable and available infrastructure for serving web and mo mobile content and digital advertisement, various high volume and high performance chemical or bioinformatics tools, storage and backup software. Currently, he heads and uh, heads data and analytics at Comili Media. Uh, Sanjeev is TOGAF certified enterprise architect and MBA from Santa Clara University. All right. And then uh, we have on my extreme right, uh, uh, Apur Gupta. Is that? Okay. Apur Gupta is co-founder of Venera, a startup uh, bringing search and analytics to modern data centers. Previously, he's built many systems at places including Bell Labs and most recently at Google. At Google, he had donned many hats including designing critical systems like AdWords serving and AdWords reporting. He's passionate about making software go fast and applying technology to real world problems. That's a pull for you. And uh, to my left, we have the lady on the panel. Monica Pal is a CMO of Aerospike. Uh, she started a career in R&D at Apple, working on Mac, uh, TCP, and Apple's unified messaging products. She then caught the startup bug, and since in a startup, uh, you do whatever needs to be done. She went into marketing. Right? Uh, she has since, since been running marketing and launched a number of startups in the internet security and middleware segments, and is now at Aerospike. She has an uh, MS in computer science from uh, University of Wisconsin at Madison, and a BA in computer science from Rice University. And of course, uh, we have uh, uh, the other panelist, uh, Dipinder Dingra. Could you raise your hand, please? From Mu Sigma. He leads product strategy for Mu Sigma. In his role, he's responsible for conceptualizing and guiding the vision for development of platforms and solutions that help Mu Sigma scale the use of analytics and decision sciences. Prior to Mu Sigma, Dipinder worked in various operating roles in consulting, product management, and pre sales for enterprise software firms such as Tipco and i2 Technologies. He has a BTEC from IIT Kanpur and an MS from University of Massachusetts. All right. So as you can see, we've got a, a very uh, exciting set of panelists today for the topic. Uh, I'd just like to probably open by um, you know, giving you a sense of what we're going to have in terms of the format. We're going to have two segments today, and uh, the audience will be given the opportunity to, to answer, ask questions at the end of each segment. That's how we have kind of structured the format. Um, so primarily, uh, we're going to have two segments. First segment is actually going to be called Demystifying Real-Time Analytics. There's been a lot of talk about it, and uh, I think the panel panelists thought that it was important to uh, to settle the dust in the air. So uh, that's the first topic. So I would request each of the panelists to give their take on the topic. Perhaps we'll start with Seth. So uh, uh, thanks for listening to us on a Saturday evening, of course. The, there, there are a bunch of challenges that you know every one of us face in terms of real-time analytics, and I'll bring from my context what uh, what it is. Is so we are um, not over here. 
check, check. Okay. So hope this time it's it's audible. Um, so presenting from an index context and what is that we do have as a you know, how do we solve this problem from from our context? You know. So uh, people come to us, customers or users come to us and. Okay, check, check. So they come to us to expect prices of products that are sold across multiple stores and expect them to be as accurate as possible. And it's a simple problem. So the multiple things that we have to do in order to make that happen, you know, this is a, this is the context of, uh, hey, how is the product matched with other stores? Exactly the same product, the same bottle of water being sold by 100 different stores and the price of the same bottle of water across those 100 different stores. I know it's not about one pack, two pack, four pack, 10 pack, you know, all of those are different things. So they have different prices, so we gotta get that right. Now, how do we get this right in a you know, real time, you know, in terms of making sure up to the second price accuracy is a, is a problem, right? So in my context, I'm gonna use that as an example, you know, I'm maybe using different things. So on others, we'll talk about it from their point of perspective, so. Okay, uh, so the way I think about real-time analytics is um, essentially conditioned by what we do for our clients in New Sigma. Um, I think some form of real-time analytics has been around for a long while. Uh, the concept of real-time analytics has evolved, right? Uh, let's say about 10 years back, you know, real-time was getting the latest information, right? Not having to wait for, you know, 24 hours, a week, a day to actually get the latest information so you can make a decision. Uh, then, uh, you know, the, the next thing was, can I get the latest information when I want it? Right, instead of, you know, I get the latest information, uh, but can I do it on demand, right? But now what uh, what we've seen real-time analytics evolving to is the ability to make decisions in real time. Uh, we think a lot about decisions, uh, the purpose of analytics and big data and whatever we call is to help you make better decisions. And so what does that mean? There are situations where two things happen where uh, you need real-time analytics or whether you call it near real-time analytics whether it's millisecond analytics, so on and so forth. First, you have to act on the latest information. If the customer's on a website, I cannot wait to act. I need to act on the information that he's giving me today based on his behavior on the website. That's number one. And you cannot wait to act, right? So I have to act on the latest information that the customer is giving me. Uh, I'm taking the example of a customer, but it uh, applies to other situations as well. So I cannot, as well as I cannot wait, uh, wait to act on it, right? Because once a customer is uh, you know, out of my website, uh, whatever action I do is no longer relevant, right? So there are two driving forces, uh, forces. You know, can I get the latest information about the customer based on you know what he's doing right now, as well as then can I analyze that you know in in real time and then act on it? So that, those are the two driving forces we think for near real time analytics or real time analytics, or whatever, you look, whatever you'd like to call it. Yeah. Hello, check, check. Okay, so when, it, when you think about real-time analytics, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm very simple. It's real-time and it's analytics, but real-time means many things for different people. Uh, real-time, as you mentioned, Dipendra could be, you know, I don't, I'm not waiting weeks or days, I'm getting it today. Uh, real-time may be sub-milliseconds, as in real-time bidding, where within 100 milliseconds you have to make a decision. Uh, analytics is really, as you said, decision-making. Uh, I actually believe that every application moving forward is going to be about real-time analytics, because every application is making decisions in real-time, whether it is a decision on price, whether it is a decision on personalizing a web page, or putting a, the right offer in front of the right person. So I really believe real-time analytics is every application moving forward. Having said that, uh, perhaps today, if you look at um, the way things are segmented, you had batch analytics, which was the past. Uh, as people are wanting to do, um, make decisions on streaming data, real-time incoming data, et cetera, that's more of what people are talking about when we talk about real-time analytics. Um, I actually see it divided into what I call HDFS analytics, so stuff using the Hadoop infrastructure, and what I call hot analytics, which is on operational data. So, um, you know, that's a different take at it. Um, thanks, Monica. And uh, I'll, I'll take up from you, Monica, a few things. And I, I 
classify real time in a context of art te technology in three parts. Uh, one is a real time decision making where you have in a real time bidding system and you have to calculate what is the pricing for your inventory you can be and 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 we lose a lot of real time um, and and the batch uh, processing together and marry them and and come up those real time pricing the second is how you classify and segment so we keep uh, getting a lot of real time streaming information about user behavior you classify runtime and it it has to marry from and you have to retrain your model again and again and on fastest possible time and the third part goes more like operational part of it um, you know in Arctic technology, for example, you have these campaigns and things are changing on a platform in, in a real time, and there are multiple levers for that. And you will have one or two person managing 500 campaigns and unless you automate it and put this operational analytics, a class of what I'll call a real-time analytics, which are operational analytics, where you have a streaming data, you have batch information, historical information, correlate it and see if something is changing. If it is say, changing something, and then you generate some events which kind of change your, like say if I'm, I'm putting a pricing you know, multiplier and change them at run time. Uh, and that's kind of real time for me in, in the context of ad tech technology. Uh, so yeah, uh, so Venera is in the space of uh, basically applying analytics and search to data centers. Now that is essentially operational data, right? But it is operational data about machines. And there, things can go south very, very fast. So how soon can you capture data? How soon can you analyze that something is wrong? And how soon can you act upon it is critical to the success of the business, right? Uh, so that's where we come in. But taking a more general view, there are some things which have always been real time, right? Uh, you swipe a credit card, the transaction has to finish in a certain time. Uh, real time bidding, it has to finish in a certain amount of time. Analytics, or at least what this conference is about, is big data analytics, right? So there's lots of data. You need to recompute some models. Can you, how soon do you want to ingest the new data and reflect it in your models, right? Uh, and this is what we call as near real time analytics. Or the, the longer you move the window, to reacting to the entire world, the better it is, right? And you hit certain limits. I mean, ultimately you hit the physics limit. That light travels only so fast. So let's say a click is happening in Europe, right? And you're doing your analysis, uh, let's say in New York, it will take certain time for things to come back. Right? There is a physical limit to it. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, we need to distinguish between big data real-time analytics versus you have an offline model and you just need to evaluate it uh, when something is coming in. What are the... All right. One of the things in a lot of people's mind is obviously real time is exciting. It also comes with a lot of investment. So uh, what are the takes of the panel in terms of the return on investment on real-time analytics and what kind of experience can you folks share on that? So can we perhaps start with uh, maybe... Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, um, I'll again uh, bring the art takes context. The, Time is the value, you know. So, so like if if a user or if it's an audience is uh, is doing something, is checking for you know clothes and somewhere e-commerce sites, and how soon we target them is the money. And uh, in our experiences, if if you go and target a customized and personalized message to an audience um, within a minute has increased, given us at least 30% boost on the conversions we can drive. And and so, um, and uh, you know, kind of what kind of uh, return we have seen, it's just not the, you know, I'll not say that it's just the money part of how much dollar you make, but kind of impact which you make on your uh, campaigns or advertisement for your customers, that itself is huge. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I, I think the ROI you could think about from a micro and a macro perspective. Uh, the micro perspective, very similar to uh, our, what he was saying. Uh, essentially, you know, we, I'll give it to you in the context of an example. Uh, you know, we were doing this, uh, uh, you know, initiative for a, for an e-commerce retailer, and they had to make a decision of whether I should give a customer a chat window when they are on my website based on certain characteristic and behavior that the customer exhibited on the chat uh, on, on the website during the session. Now the ROI aspects of that are embedded into the analytics uh, that you try to drive in with that information that you have. Because I might just give everyone a chat window, uh, but that might not lead to ROI because you know behind the chat window is a customer service representative who's going to talk to you and that is that the time of the customer service representative is money, right? So what is the ROI of your probability of conversion that you'll buy something if I can help guide you through a chat window and a customer service representative answering your questions vis-a-vis -vis versus you know what is the cost of actually giving you that chat window? So there are certain micro aspects on the ROI which are embedded into the analytics that you do uh, on top of the infrastructure that you might want to deploy for something like real-time analytics. At the micro, at the macro level, I think like uh, Mo uh, Monica was saying, you know, you know, is everything going to become real time, right? Uh, the the business case at the macro level is, what is the speed of your business? What is the rate of change of your business? Now it's a no-brainer for an e-commerce company, uh, or for an ad tech company, or and so on and so forth. But can I uh, imagine a manufacturing company thinking about real time? Can I imagine, uh, you know, uh, you know, a supply chain company thinking of real time? And so you have to think about at a macro level: Am I going to invest in this kind of technology? Invest in the kind of analytics to drive the decisions that I'm trying to do? What is the experience I need to drive off my business when I interact with my customer? So that's the macro perspective that comes into that picture. Yeah, uh, I I have a slightly different take on it, but law of diminishing returns always apply, right? Uh, there is something which if you make it fast, now you're doing it in like 100 milliseconds and you have gained for your business, right? Uh, but then if you can do it in like 50 milliseconds, going from 100 to 50 need, does not give you that return. It might give you some return, but the law of diminishing return applies. And conversely, uh, there's a cost to it, right? Uh, the cost of, after some time, the cost just becomes too high because uh, you have to build new infrastructure to do this. Uh, so it really depends on business to business, as the panel said. So um, I'll, I'll give a couple of um, real world use cases or real world examples of where people have benefited um, after using our service. Um, so this is a, a large retailer uh, focusing on, uh, it's an IR50 retailer. Um, about focusing on grocery, health, and personal care type category. So they were, um, you know, they were they were clearly before they started using our service. What were their profit margins on a category like uh, diapers? You know, largest uh, sales of diapers in happens in U.S. and online. And uh, you know, after they introduced the ability to dynamically price their products based on competitive landscape analysis <coughs> and being able to. <clears throat> being able to respond to it in in very short span of time, uh, they were doing A/B testing to say, okay, well, what if we do this? What if we don't do this? Uh, for certain customers, they were using it. For certain customers, they were not real time um, responsive dynamic pricing. And based on that, they actually saw a three percent increase in their profit because three percent sounds very small, but actually in the space of internet, uh, you know, commerce, three percent is a big jump in uh, for their size. It's a multi-billion dollar company. Um, so you know it's a it's a very clear ROI when it comes down to it has to be applied to the use case. You cannot just say assume just because I'm doing real time, I'm expecting my return on investment to go up, but I have to really really take into context of where does it apply and what is the cost that I'm going to take on for this. And if there is a service that makes it available at a price point that is um, predictable, and then it's much easier for them. You know, for us, we provide them a very specific price point, and that's fixed for the month. They don't change it just because they use it. They don't use it. So that's that's a good example of how uh, people use something real time to convert into dollars that they got. Hello, yeah. Um, the ROI on real time analytics. Um, you know, I think when we talk about big data, everybody's been talking about variety. They've been talking about uh, volume. 
Uh, this is about velocity. Uh, velocity is directly related to value because that's when money changes hands. Uh, when you talk about real-time analytics, uh, basically it's about now. In real-time bidding, if you snooze, you lose. If you don't show up for the auction, you don't bid. Uh, you don't have a, you, you just don't make money. But more important than that, if you, when you show up, you have to make sure that you're putting the most best offer, you know, the winning bid in there. So, and even, you know, when you talk about pricing or, or, or serving people on a website, not only do you have to deliver that web, web page really fast, but it has to be relevant, right? So the ROI of real-time analytics is that you show up and you show up with the right stuff so that people care. And if people care, then you have a chance of making money um, and uh, you know winning a customer. Thank you. Those were interesting perspectives: thirty percent conversions, um, you know, the macro micro view, and then of course the law of diminishing returns, and of course it finally depends on the context. So that leaves in a lot of room for people to interpret it the way they like. All right, I think uh, we'll probably uh, throw it open now for some questions on the discussion thus far and. Uh, the gentleman there in the white shirt, can somebody give him a mic? We have a spare mic here. Okay. Yeah, so we had a discussion saying that, okay, we need to move fast. That was one point. The second point is uh, when you are acting fast, you have to act relevantly. That's what she meant. And there was something related to A-B testing. So there will be situations where you can actually do the A-B testing. Like the example where Speak you into the mic for the benefit yeah, of sorry. others. So uh, there will be situations where you can do the A-B testing instead of the analytics. Like uh, whether you want to serve the chat window to the customer. So how do you take the decision there? Whether you need to take the analytics or just go with a, say, 1% A-B testing for the customers. <laughs> and based on those results, take a decision. Satya? I mean, in, in the context of what I mentioned as AB is, uh, the, this customer was actually trying to evaluate the ROI, right? Now, they clearly saw their ability to close, their ability to convert that customer to buy stuff was higher in the case when they were using real-time dynamic pricing as an option. When they were not using dynamic pricing, when they were not really actually having a check before they presented the price, did they actually check against their competitors in that few milliseconds? And if they did not present for a certain set of users, they did not use real time, and they, the number of conversions were low. You know that was the deciding factor for them. So it is the question of using AB as a, just a way to decide, to say, is this useful? Has it helping me really get my ROI, or is it not helping me? You know, then that's just a way to decide for them, you know, justification for them. Right? Uh, can we? Sorry. Can we inter interpret the question in another way? Uh, not using real time would mean not personalization and would mean a dissatisfaction and it could decrease the loyalty and end the number of, and, and, and the end your revenues will be coming down. So is it, is it really the, currently the real time is in that, at that mature stage or is it really improving the returns today? I may need to reconstruct your question for my benefit. Um, you know, so uh, can can we play along as in? So if you say you know, whether real time did it help or not, you know, we need to say uh, what is the context in which it's going to help or not, right? So uh, the 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 purpose here is, um, you know, are you using this information? You know, if, if if it's if it's to present the which product is a different question. Let's say should I present this. Um, variant versus this variant to this user. That's a different story, you know. Um, you know, it, there's personal choices here and all involved. Pricing is a very simple decision where you can comparatively use it you know, very clearly and it makes a, you know, break or make or break. So if you elaborate your question from where, how do you interpret it uh, differently? So we can, we can take that. Uh, I mean, I mean, uh, what I'm, what I would mean is, uh, few of the things are good to go. Right. There are few things uh, which are needed to be go in the market. Right. Still, really, a real time market is a need to go or as a good to go? Good. Okay. So that helps. That definitely helps. I mean, at least from my context, right? So there, would, uh, there were a bunch of others who actually say their domain. I'll tell the example here. Um, you know, they are in the lighting solutions domain, right? They're, there's a retailer who sells lighting online, right? Now, they know for sure the lighting prices don't change so frequently. 
so they clearly decided that your real time is not going to help me because I'm good that 24 hours old data is good for me. We take uh, prices as of 12 uh, midnight PST and then next day morning at 9 a.m. they have all the data. They have all the data that is completely crunched and tell them that what product should be acted on, what product should not be acted on. Now that's good for them, right? So because their domain doesn't change so frequently. But whereas like diapers, um, mobile phones and like, you know, electronic items and stuff like that. So there are there is competitive landscape which brings a certain you know certain dimension of uh, like, you know, dimension of dynamic pricing involved. Um, you know Amazon. I don't know how many people from Amazon here, but let's say they say you know they change prices on certain products five times a day, you know ten times a day. You know if that happens, if anybody wants to compete, yes, they have to really have the ability to do it. So it varies from um, the the category manager who's responsible for the 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 actual uh, you know profit margins that they're expected to deliver. Um, I think it's very very contextual to that. Uh, so the, uh, I'll add uh, some of more my uh, my perspective to that question. That like say if if I talk about ad tech technologies, um, say uh, our experience says that on a shopping cart somebody was on a shopping cart and he event in some item and you target them within a minute or like say initially we targeting them after three hours and we reduce it to a one minute and the CTR which is your click through rate has improved from 0.2% to 0.6% and then we find you know then we added to add that at within one minute we can know that what he is doing and then we personalize the advertisement for them and the CTR goes to 0.7 even 0.8% and that's a huge difference for us in terms of our ROI. You know, what I also heard was, you know, should I really bother to do this, right? So it's your decision whether you want to be the first mover and take advantage of that opportunity, leverage the technology that you have available to you, or you wait for your competition and then you play catch up. I think that's. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, okay, right. I'll come to you next. <clears throat> So um, uh, I had a question with respect to, um, so, uh, you know, most of the people here talked about shaving my milliseconds, you know, from, you know, a few milliseconds you already had, you know, how do you shave off that milliseconds to actually make, you know, the response time faster. Uh, and most of you touched upon e-commerce as well. Uh, but there are some factors in e-commerce where, you know, the real time is, is probably uh, one of the criteria, but it is probably not the most significant criteria. To give you an example, suppose I were to buy a, a, a phone which costs 15,000 rupees. Um, just because somebody gives me a lower price, I may not purchase from him because maybe I trust Flipkart to deliver the phone to me. You know, uh, they would uh, give an unopened box. Uh, and have you seen situations where, you know, shaving off those seconds really did not help and then you had to work on things which were really not real time. You know, things which had to be worked in the back end or things which were offline or which could not be captured by a click, you know, go and fix the. Yeah, I, th I, I think your question is very valid, right? So real time is, is probably not going to change the experience. Uh, you know, you have, to dis you have to decide what the differentiation of your company is, right? Uh, there are certain things you'll do in real time for operations, preventing errors in, the, in, in, in your website because if there's an error in your website, if you can troubleshoot it as fast as possible, you can you know, prevent the opportunity cost of that, right? But there's certain things you have to decide what is your company or what is the company known for. Uh, a company like Apple is known for design. A company like Flipkart uh, is probably known for something else. A company like Amazon is probably known for something else, right? So the, if you figure out the vectors of your, the, the experience or the dimension that you want to differentiate on, then that helps you focus on what should be real time and what doesn't need to be real time, right? So I, I think your question is just valid. I don't know if you asked your question, but that's how you need to think about it, yeah. My question about uh, the use cases. In addition to the ad tech world or the operations analytics use case, uh, are there any other use cases where the monetization of these real-time analytics is happening. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can. I can uh, start. So we've done a lot of work on uh, this whole area of Internet of Things is probably something that you guys are familiar with, which is not only you know collecting information from human behavior, 
but from what machines are saying, right? And machine to machine interactions, right? So can I analyze data from videos uh, on a retail floor to understand store traffic patterns in real time and figure out how I can lay out my stores better? So the analysis might be in real time, uh, but the action actually might take more time because in a retail store, it's a physical operation. You cannot just move things automatically, right? Uh, can I help uh, a maintenance engineer who's walking into a, to a maintenance room of our power circuit breaker and in, based on you know, in an application that gets real-time information about the voltage uh, and current information of that device, can I figure out whether you know, he or she should really approach that because you, know, you might cause an accident, right? So there are a lot of other applications which are not related to directly to e-commerce, uh, but they're more related to how you, uh, you, know, the, you know, different kinds of data, whether that's sensor data, whether that's you know, machine data, so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, my yeah. sorry. Go ahead. My perspective is that um, uh, I think you know ad tech companies are clearly pioneers in the space. The enterprise is still trying to gather all the data, right? First step is bring out everything, build your Hadoop clusters, pour all the data in, run your initial analytics. So I think most enterprises are still at that stage, and then after they've got some of these insights, then they're looking to see, okay, how how can I programmatically in real time act on it? So I think we're still in early days on that. Yeah. Let me give an example, right? Uh, Uber is a classic example. Like all this logistics, uh, the more real-time information about location you have, that's a classic example of they benefit by doing better routing. Right. So one example that I come across is um, security, network security in terms of network intrusion and detection. So somebody is actually hacking into your network or breaking into your network, and how do you... Actually, you know, it could be a genuine user too, but there are things that you would like to do. Now, you have uh, certain signals that are coming from the network and you have historic data to detect, is this a potential harmful user with a harmful intent? And then at what point do you actually stop them? You know, you have to really, really recover from the situation. Now, this is something that you have to do and then probably you only have a window of few seconds to, to act on it and, and otherwise you compromise lots of things. I mean, you end up getting lawsuits because of you allowed somebody to compromise data you know, for the network for you. So. Yeah, one more example, right? Operational intelligence again. Uh, you pushed a new version of a software. You're doing a rolling upgrade. Things are going south. If you can detect it as soon as the first one hits, you can probably prevent your thing from going down. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, I just had a question. So uh, based on business decisions, you know, we get certain part of our business model to be real time and then we do analytics on that. And if some percentage of our data is still on batch mode and still on static. So uh, does the real time engine, you know, constantly talk to the static data once in a while so that you learn from whatever, uh, you know, other information you're gathering as well or does it function as a standalone? The reason why I'm asking this is to, you know, to to get an eye opener on what's actually happening with brands which uh, implement real time analytics sure so um, that, that's an interesting question and uh, answer depends on the context uh, you know who talks to who but you know when a real time analytics and the batch batch uh, you know batch historical data which you have and when you're making a decision a process which making a decision has to correlate between both so I'll give you an example that um, I have a video download happening and I'm monitoring in real time and streaming data. And what has happened is that um, tomorrow at 3 p.m. I have like 1,000 downloads and today is zero download now. Then something has to be act, something is not going right. So you have to correlate between both. And similar example I can give in ad tech technology, for example, every day, every hour, what kind of bidding happens, what kind of, you know, um, you know, request is coming and what kind of probability of conversion are changes. But if there is any problem in your system or something happens, it has to correlate and go back to historical data. So it doesn't, it cannot work in isolation. Both has to work in uh, together. But there has to be a proxy and coordinator which takes a decision. So I'll, I'll give another example for the same uh, to just reinforce the message. Yes, it is important that the real time has to consider the data that is computed by the batch. Um, so let's say you are a user on a website, uh, just submitted a review and a rating for a product. And you said this rating is four, 
and the number of people who actually reviewed was originally 45 and it became 46. <clears throat> for you as a user, if it doesn't increase the counter to 46, you know, for you it's a feedback loop not closed. So the system has to actually take the data that the batch system had processed, it's 45 people, and the real-time system said it's one person, then you need to combine them and show this guy 46. Maybe other people are still seeing 45, that's fine. But this person cannot see 45, they have to see 46. So this is, you know, very important for, you know, it, it may not have the real-time aspects of millisecond thing, but it is the feedback loop and the user perception is important. Yeah. I'd just like to add one point. So, so there are two kinds of interactions between real time and the batch aspect, right? One is the analytics relationship, right? The analytics relationship says that in real time I want to sense, process, react, and then in batch I will retrospect. When I retrospect, I actually improve my real time analysis because there must be some information uh, that can actually help me improve my model, algorithm, so on and so forth. That's the analytical perspective. Now the other perspective is actually the business perspective, right? So uh, in, in, in real time, a customer came to a website, you know, I gave him an offer, maybe that offer was not the right offer, or there was some error. The inventory replenishment did not happen the way that it should have, and he got the wrong product. Some, let's imagine a scenario. Now what you need to do is, that happened in real time, and whatever drove that, there was some analytics that drove that, and so on and so forth. Now that real time action led to a problem in the non-real time space. So you came from the virtual space to the physical space. Now the physical space is, I have an unsatisfied customer. Instead of having a satisfied customer, which you mostly would think about in a real time scenario, and that's, you know, we mo mostly talk about that, but now I have an unsatisfied customer. Now, you know, the real time information that you had of the customer needs to be thought about in the context of what you know about the customer beyond the behavioral aspects that the customer exhibited when you did the real time decision, right? And so that aspect is, is also a different aspect because at that it's not just about analytics, it's about making sure that the consequences of your real-time decisioning using real-time analytics are now being felt in a world that is offline. And how do you manage that offline relationship with a customer is more of a business aspect that you have to think about uh, when you're actually thinking about making certain aspects real-time in your, in your business. Yeah. Hi, uh, this is Jeffrey here. Um, I have a question on... Uh, the barrier to uh, what constitutes a barrier to real-time analytics. So, um, so there was um, an observation that there are, of course, fundamental limits that you cannot breach. But then uh, there are other, uh, perhaps fundamental. I don't know. That is also that could also be a question. Um, the closest that you can get to real-time processing is if you're not processing at data rate, but you're in uh, you're processing at information rate. Right? I mean, yeah, that's the closest you can get. You cannot subsample below information rate. Uh, and the time that requires to process that is real time. That would be the definition. Uh, to reach there, I, I either, so there is one algorithmic aspect and then there is the engineering aspect. Currently, what constitutes a bigger barrier? I mean, uh, which one is more unsolved? So I think the next part of the questions is exactly about you infrastructure and algorithms. Preempted segment too, so let me drive us into that. Anyway, um, I think, um, the conversation started started uh, leading into the current state of uh, real-time analytics as well as in terms of the barriers and where is it heading from here. So that's where I think uh, they wanted to also touch upon some of the developments on the infrastructure, the algorithms and how is it impacting everything else. Probably I'd request uh, Apo to kick it off. Um, okay. So as I said, right, uh, the question is how real-time, the law of diminishing return also applies. Do you really need to process it at that rate? And can you process it at that rate? So let's say you decide uh, that, hey, I need to do this in 10 milliseconds, right? Now, here's your classic algorithm for solving the problem. Look at all the data, build this model, and apply it uh, to this new data point, and take a decision, right? Now, clearly, that is not feasible. Uh, but that problem has been solved long ago. You build the model offline. Uh, and you take the decision. The next problem comes, can I update my models frequently enough, right? Then the question is, how soon is enough? And it depends on, on like the volume also, right? Uh, if you have a low volume of arrival, then you would want to incorporate like the previous points because the relative amount of data, recent data, uh, is has higher fidelity to the predicting the new data, right? 
and uh, so there are some engineering challenges and there are algorithmic challenges right for example let's say you trained in svm you cannot update in svm uh, with a new data point right then and there the best you can do is you can use an online svm algorithm but its guarantee is about that it's going to be no more than 2x worse uh, than a classic svm algorithm using maximum likelihood estimation right so that that's an algorithm problem uh, there are engineering problems too uh, as in like okay uh, this point alone i can't process it or at least to process it i need to bring in this much data can i bring in this much data in 10 milliseconds in order to process it and so that places limitations on the model sizes right uh, or let's say it's a complex gaussian model you can't evaluate it so you probably just go with a linear kernel to do that right and this is where uh, the things are very correlated advances in infrastructure enable advances in algorithms right and i think monica will touch upon that but the fact that you have ssds means you have more storage which can respond in that time which means you can build larger models larger models means more accurate models generally speaking right and sometimes uh, algorithms sort of demand other things from infrastructure and infrastructure evolves to do that right they say can you get this batch as soon as you get it can you push it to me so that i can process it i have figured out a way to update it right but in general i see algorithms as a slightly bigger barrier to just to answer your previous question um so i think you were asking you know uh what where's the barrier right whether it's at the uh, uh engineering or technology um hard infrastructure level or is it at the algorithm level is that Currently, yeah. Um, so I obviously, Aerospike sits at the infrastructure level. Uh, our whole thesis, the reason why the company was founded was because basically uh, the founders said, you know, hey, there's new processors out there, new processor technology, multi-core, multi-CPU servers. There's new storage technology out there, flash, right? SSDs, PCIe cards. And so they literally rebuilt the database in C from scratch, you know, every line. And they tuned it line by line by line to go, make it go as fast as it does today. So they weren't trying to build you know, 10x better than Oracle. They were focused on the hardware. And so really leveraging Moore's law, right? So parallelizing across cores, across SSDs, et cetera. So from our perspective, we actually believe that we have a rocket uh, that people haven't discovered that they can act, that some of these things are actually possible, that you can actually crunch way more data way faster. So I'm really excited because with Aerospike going open source just a few weeks ago, um, I can't wait to see what you guys will start building with it, now that you know that it's possible. So from a, from a slightly different take, you know, it depends on, there's a maturity about the, the team that's taking on this challenge of building something like this. So technology is not readily available on a platter like a single unified stack. You know, you've heard the last two days, maybe even the workshops, that um, a lot of people are actually, it's a cutting edge research, and, and a lot of people are still figuring out, cherry picking technology choices that are there. Like, you know, should I choose Storm, Kafka? Should I choose Sparse, Sparse Streaming? Should I go cl Cloud Dataflow? Or should I do something completely on my own? Should I just go Summingbird? Or like, you know, we, we did our own, we, we, we modeled based on Lambda architecture and we built our own stuff. So there are different people exactly in the same space as like we're doing, everybody's solving the problem. So that requires, a, you know, to make it land a project like this, to make it really see the benefit to the end users, the significant maturity and engineering talent required to make it happen. That is going to be a big barrier by itself. I mean, just the talent, the know-how to, to successfully deliver something like this, to build something and to make it really see all the ROI we talked about to make it happen, that's the first barrier. Now, certainly it's infrastructure we heard is not ready or there are only people investing and we need fundamentally rewrite the databases to meet this kind of a need um, you know, to, to suit today's hardware availability. You know, that definitely is another barrier. I think all of these are barriers. Algorithms are a barrier. And I don't think batch algorithms really work here. You got to go for approximation. And the moment you ask approximation, everybody comes with only one name called hyperloglog -log, and after that they know they're lost. They don't even know what the next algorithm is, right? So, and that's not going to solve all problems. So. We got to, either if there are algorithms available, that means we need to try. If there are not available, we're going to invent, and people are going to come up with that. 
so this is just happening i think in probably next year's uh, fifth elephant we probably will see more people coming up talk specifically on algorithms that are actually solving the problem in the more context there um, all of these are barriers in my view and we had to solve them um, over the last two years because if it was available we would just taken it it wasn't there so we had to invent it you know so i my view is all of them are real challenges right um so i might want to answer the question on the barriers uh, but i'll just give you some experience of what we've been doing um you know so if you think about you know which guys are you know who's spearheading real time there are about three broad categories actually actually two broad categories of real time and then on the big data side there's one broad category so on the real time side we've always known the financial you know the high frequency trading guys have been doing it and those guys have traditionally relied a lot on a lot on the enterprise service bus complex event processing kind of technologies uh then there's a very interesting area uh the whole robotics and artificial intelligence area which has been relying a lot on uh this whole uh, concept of agent based you know uh you know infrastructure uh, agent based systems uh which is essentially around you know you can find a lot of open source stuff also the jade the java agent development environment so on and so forth and you know that's really focused on the concept of mob- mobility and edge computing which which we are seeing a lot of uh, a lot of applications in because uh, we're doing a lot of stuff in the internet of things area uh, which you know uh, which required which require edge computing right how can i transfer the computational capacity and the ability to orchestrate the comp- computation which has the infrastructure as well as the the algorithms uh, as close to the event generation or uh, to the data generation so if you see seeing a lot of that we are doing a lot of work in that uh, area then there's the whole the e- the e-commerce companies have you know spearheaded the whole uh, hadoop stack and sdfs uh you know now you know with you know things like spark like satya mentioned coming in etc storm coming in uh so that's kind of whole another area of you know infrastructure that's helping build this real time real time intelligence systems we believe that you should think about three areas of focus if you think at a macro level uh you know the earlier thing that i said was more around the uh the, the you know getting inspiration from different places but three areas of focus that we see is think about high performance computation uh, which is not only scaling analytics to bigger and bigger data sets but also scaling at an analytics to billions of computations and the whole area of gp gpu computing that's one aspect the other aspect i think satya talked about is you know algorithms in batch do not work in alg- for for data in motion so approximations we are doing a lot of work in meta heuristics you know things like you know if i did if i wanted to do optimization a traditional mathematical programming technique would would take minutes and hours but if i can u- use new heuristic algorithms you know inspired by bi- biological systems you know those actually run faster because they're more search based and more hu- heuristic based and then there's a whole area of infrastructure you should think about usability and visualization uh, because you know if you're going to help see one of the key things is that we've been talking about automated decision decisioning for real time uh but what if i needed a human to make a decision uh it seems counterintuitive but if i if i can give a human uh the most relevant information uh you know and that decision can be made uh, by a human being then uh, then it is imperative on me to think about usability and visualization right and new metaphors for usability and visualization that can help a human being make sense of that information whether that information is powered by intelligence from algorithms or whether that, that information is powered by concepts of visualization uh, or you know advanced algorithms that help you make your visualizations even intelligent things like graph analytics and topological data analysis how can i speed the insight that a human can get from real time information and that is a huge area as well you could think about that as a barrier i don't know if i uh, you know if that's a barrier but we find that the ability for humans to consume insights from real time information and so you have to think about visualization and usability aspects so the three broad areas you should think about there right thanks for that sure so i'll uh, start from uh, satya's point on exact you know approximation in when you bring the real time and and when you bring when you do approximation you are putting some a statical system in place when you put a statical system in place uh, you will have outliers and how you take care of those outliers is pretty big barrier and and if you give example from from artech world say like 
in a, our beating system, we have a 15 minutes window when we refresh our data with the actual data. And this 15 minutes, um, the data is all approximation and the, the variation of these outliers are so high, varies every day, every events, every hours, and that has been a big injuring problem for us to uh, tackle us. Our systems, like in a certain uh, time frame, thinks that uh, we are out of budgets when actually we are not and we are not serving advertisements and we think we lose a lot of uh, opportunity because of those. So that's, in my opinion, is a big uh, barrier. You must use the mic, please. Uh, that would just mean that perhaps the approximation is wrong. I mean, Can you speak there the could mic? be better approximation algorithms. Uh, I mean, like you said, there's just one, perhaps. That's uh, that, that could be the case. That would be the case. But uh, our observation is that how brilliantly we can remove those outliers, uh, that will solve our problem. And, uh, and we have not been very successful so far. I mean, that's just saying that's not the case. If you look at, like, Sigmod papers from, like, 2000 till 2010, uh, there were always, like, at least three or four papers on streaming algorithms, right? Uh, but the problem is they are not accurate enough. Okay, um, given that it's uh, a Saturday evening and we are heading close to 7, we'll probably uh, take a few more questions from the audience and then uh, wrap up. Any other questions? Awesome. Let's uh, gentlemen here. So the question I had was really um, around, uh, let, let's say, the relevance uh, for real-time analytics in India. Um, when you have very tight budgets, when you have, uh, you know, a um, lot of focus on productivity and um, I would say getting your technology infrastructure right, uh, how do you sell um, real-time analytics to a client? Definitely uh, not necessarily technology. I think the, I, I touched upon briefly in earlier points is if there is a service available which is at a fixed price point, you know, and you can take, you have a choice whether, and you're clearly saying, if I have enough contextual information about the user or something which I can use to say, here if I use the real time capability and I probably will pay per usage of the API or for, for the call that I make, if I'm going to pay a fixed amount of fee, it will monetize well because I have a complete choice in my hand. I'm not have to pay an upfront fee of any kind. But are there services that can distill, are there technology players that can distill all of this complexity, provide a solution that's simple enough and at a very simple price point that easily measurable? You get, you get a decision from a batch-based data, it costs you X. And if it costs you, say, 2X, now, the ROI is clearly in my choice. I can make for which kind of a context can I use the real time? Is it needed or not needed? So I know what price I'll pay incrementally. I'll pay a double, but I know for sure. The information is in my hands as a user and talking about, right? <clears throat> so how many, and I think that technology maturity has to happen. All people who are solving this problem from an end user businesses to use perspective, they're thinking that line. You know, not, it's not solvable from a, I have to pay, you know, an upfront fee of $100,000 to actually even start getting ready for it. It doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, um, sorry, Monica, just, just before, uh, Satya, the, the point uh, was really not um, around uh, establishing a clear case, right? Because what we said is this is new. Uh, this is, yeah, sorry. Uh, the, the point, uh, you know, is when you're having new technology, there's not enough uh, case study references. <coughs> ROI itself was such a difficult uh, question to answer, right? Right. So, so you don't have those specific case studies for customers where, you know, you can definitely say this. Then there was another question about, you know, indep really independent variables. Was it these factors which caused uh, the, you know, increase in spend, the 3% increase, et cetera, or was it other factors? So, so, so one is, I think, those aspects where, which is a challenge. The other is really, uh, you know, how ready is the market? Okay, I, I think I'll answer that. You see, um, that's a very general question in the sense that it's typical of anything that comes new to the marketplace. Right? There's always uh, people, buyers have different mindsets, right? There are some who wait for somebody to try it out 
there is some of a mindset of wanting to be ahead and experiment with things. So I think it's uh, to answer your question, is it India specific? No, I mean I, I work with many customers globally. I think it's a common universal challenge where uh, it's like uh, uh, you know uh, different customers in different geographies have different approaches to new technology and how they adopt them. It's often an enterprise strategy, sometimes defined, sometimes not very well defined. Sometimes it's generally understood within the company culture right. that hey, let's wait for something to come. But in some cases, they'll say hey, guess what? Let's be ahead of the curve. Let's try and uh, do a POC and try it out. Let's get a partner to work on it. Things like that. So in that sense, I wouldn't think it's an India-specific problem. That's number one. Second thing is every new product or technology which goes through this, you know, till it becomes a hadoop, right? Yeah. I mean, um, she did mention about their own product. So it's like every product goes through that. Even hadoop probably went through that. Went through that. So not everybody knew it till it became what they, right? So likewise, I think uh, it, in that sense, everything will take its place. And uh, in order to kind of, uh, you talked about this, how do you sell something new, right? It will only have to be through benefits. There will always be something iffy about what was the root cause that actually led to that benefit. And that's a fair point that you bought. But then, uh, um, you know, that's the price that you pay as a early adopter of technology to experiment with it. Sometimes right. you win, sometimes you don't. Right. But yes, sometimes sorry, yeah. you can clearly attribute, sometimes you can't. Yes, sorry, I think sometimes it's difficult hey. not to attribute as well. Yeah, the I question, sorry, you went off track. Yeah. Okay. I think the, the question is really, let's say, Comly or um, Mu Sigma, right? Yeah. Who do they sell to? Do they sell to Indian customers or do they sell to, let's say, U.S. banks, right? So, so the, the classic example is really, you know, what do the customers see in terms of value of real analytics where they are able to pay for it right. vis-a-vis this, right? So it's, it's not, I mean, that was the real question, not the independent variable kind of thing. He's asking a question specific to your company. So I don't know if you want to take it on. Yeah. Um, so the question is, you're talking about real time and yeah. Question specific to the two companies. Yeah, I mean, I'm just setting that as a context, saying that okay. someone who's offering real time analytics, okay. how is that able to drive value? Yeah. So uh, very good question. You know. Uh, so first of all, our approach is not to go from solution and find a problem. So Mu Sigma doesn't go from a solution of real time analytics to say, here are the 10 problems I can I can approach it towards. Our approach is go to go from problem and what is the right solution. So, you know, we are not a technology company or we're not a product led company. We are an analytics and decision sciences company. So when you approach it from that perspective and when you engage with clients and you're figuring out what decisions they are trying to make some clear, some fuzzy, and some muddy, uh, some latent. Then you figure out from when you start from there, then the business case evolves to itself, right? And then you say, now do I have the capability to enable the decision with the right math, with the right business context, and the right technology? So that's our approach towards it. And we are finding, I think, uh, you know, the, this whole real-time analytics, and you know, even earlier the whole big data, uh, you know, Hadoop, and so on and so forth. These are enablers eventually. The big data hype, you know, was not there five years back when Mu Sigma started. In, uh, sorry, when Mu Sigma started in 2004, and it's slowly going to die its death as well. And so, and so will be the case with real time because it'll become part of the hygiene of the organization as a capability enabler. So our approach is not to go from the solution. So we don't go to a client and say, "Have a real time analytics solution for you." That's not what we do. But that's how Mu Sigma works. We don't we don't work from solution to problem. We go from problems to solutions. Yeah. Yes. I'll give an example in terms of from a telecom world today. You know, it's, it's about our, as as users, are we willing to pay money? Okay, so if we are ready to pay upfront in a, a significant fee for that, the benefit that comes up. So telecom is a good example in India. It's already it's actually spending a lot of my time and investing a lot of money in getting real time information from people like us, subscribers like us, and actually starting to push stuff first. Airtel is doing stuff, and I'm sure other telecom providers are doing it. I know from Airtel's example because some of the guys whom I have as colleagues or friends actually are working with the vendors who are supplying software to, to Airtel's data centers. So nothing related to this example, but it, it says it is very, very specific. And I think uh, as, as Indian consumers, we are ready for it. When we start paying for it, I think the service providers will start using that technology too late. Uh, 
uh, if I may, I, I have a slightly different take on that, right? Uh, so your question was more around our, con our business is ready for it. So this much is clear. All else being equal, if you are real time and your competitor is not, you will win, right? Now the question is, are you equal in other things? And if you're not, then, then you have a very simple decision tree. Either this can be your advantage and it will eclipse out other things, or you're so behind in other things that you need to do them first, right? And uh, we, I'm not here to set, sell snake oil. Like real-time analytics is not a panacea. It doesn't solve uh, if you have a crappy product. So, I mean, you really have to fix those things first. Good points, yeah, thanks. Any final question, or we can uh, wrap up the panel? Oh, sure. I just wanted to make one comment. You know, I, again, from an infrastructure perspective, when you look at flash economics, right? So the good news is that the infrastructure costs are going down rapidly. Even when you think about what Amazon is doing and how it's making infrastructure available at the price points it's making, I think you know that translates into business models that become viable that were not viable before as well. So I think you know it's pretty amazing what we are delivering as an industry. Um, um, you know, compared to even five years ago. Final question from the gentleman there. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Dinesh. So um, I have a question about uh, how, how do you say real-time analytics kind of playing out itself? You'll see you see it as going more like a verticalized manner. There'll be adoption and uh, technology slash uh, solutions will come out, or you see someone coming out with a more of a horizontal play. Uh, uh, across uh, major verticals or, or all verticals? So um, I think both will happen because there's so much of opportunity to grow as we talked about earlier in another question. Um, technology will come through and that will solve it from a horizontal uh, platform angle, making, giving a unified stack, making it easy for people to build systems that can coexist with bad systems. I think bad systems people are not questioning anymore. I think they're they're saying, yes, it's accepted, we want to do it, let's do it. People are in different adoption cycles, but they're doing it. Real time, at the beginning of the curve, I think technology will, enablers will come in and there will be people who will laggards who will come on board. So first, definitely technology has to enable for the critical mass to adapt it, right? There will be more number of people, there are a lot of enterprises who are still not in that space. So they'll come when it's a safe technology, very, very supported technology, and then <coughs> and they need a unified tech stack, they need trained staff, available. All of that is a necessity for some enterprises to make those decisions. It'll happen. Now during this process, <clears throat> the opportunity just like the way software as a service model disrupted, there are people who will come from vertical angles who don't need people to invest in technology or learn about technology, nothing. I didn't need to know anything. It's a hole in the wall, it's a service and I make a call and it'll respond to me in real time and it'll give me in response, let's say, okay, they'll guarantee me a 30 second, 30 millisecond response time or 50 millisecond response time. Or they'll put something in my data center, you know, and with refreshes happening or something like that. So they will figure out a way in which it can be solved in that sense. So because real time presents with the milliseconds and sub milliseconds response time sometimes, so specific vertical solutions will come up where technology is nowhere a barrier, it'll come. So I think both ways is we'll see innovations coming up in the next you know, 12, 16, 18 months. Okay, now, so thank you all for staying late uh, for this panel on a Saturday evening. We truly appreciate uh, your time and your interest in hearing the panel and uh, uh, the discussion around it. Can I request you to take a moment to give a big round of applause for all our panelists? And uh, some of them have traveled to this city to just be here with us, and thank you so much for that. Thanks again very much.